Awesome. So first off, this is quite a technical talk. So please interrupt me if you do have any questions. Um, it's very code heavy. But uh, so what this talk is, is it's an introduction to rate matching. Now, a very good question. What the heck is actually rate matching? So if any of you have done 3D graphics before, there's several different techniques of drawing to the screen. The most common in video games will be rasterization. This is where you take a 3D model. This 3D model will be made of many triangles. You then send all of that data to the GPU, and the GPU is responsible for deciding which color every pixel on the screen will be. Ray matching is slightly different to this, not to be confused with ray tracing. What we do in ray matching is we start with a um, point, and we cast this out into the scene to find out whether it hits or not. And we will gain two bits of valuable information that we'll use when deciding what color this is. So the most important thing about ray matching is you have to be able to describe your scene as a mathematical function of its distance from any point in the world. What this means is for this point in the world, the distance to scene, uh, the minimum distance to scene would be this point here. And what we'll do is we will step forward in on this ray for this pixel by that amount, because that means we're guaranteed to not hit anything in the scene because there can't be anything closer than the closest point. Then what we'll do is we'll take another check to see where the distance, the closest distance is to this point. We'll then move forward by this. And we keep doing this until we reach some kind of threshold that we decide we're happy that we've hit the scene. Now, uh, the first bit of information will be the distance to the scene itself, which we will calculate by incrementing this distance uh, on and on as we make each march of the rate. The second thing that we'll gain is the number of um, steps or iterations it took if a ray gets very close to an object, it will take significantly more steps because each, um, each uh, check that we do will say that it's close to the scene, therefore it will travel a smaller distance. And even though it doesn't necessarily hit the um, object, it does become, become very close to this, which you can use for adding glow effects because you can say, well, if we didn't hit anything but we're very close to it, then perhaps we should add like a glow to this pixel. Now. Next, I'm going to go on to actually demoing this algorithm because it's surprisingly quick to implement. So I'm starting with a very simple shader. This shader uh, takes, or shaders in general, take two um, programs. The first program is called the vertex shader. This takes all of the vertices that make up the triangles in traditional rendering, and they decide where to place them in screen space and what information uh, should be sent to the GPU from this. Uh, in this vertex shader, you'll see that we have a, a position attribute, which is the position on the, uh, the screen itself. And then we have a color attribute. And the color attribute is just which color each point of this triangle should be. And what we're using this for is to work out where on the screen we are when we do our per pixel uh, shading of the world. The fragment shader takes this color attribute. And the GPU does this very clever thing in that where each point on the scene uh, or in the triangle is specified a color. For every pixel that is within the bounds of that triangle, it will linearly interpolate the values of a varying uh, vector for, in this case, the color, so that we gradually transition from this green to black or this green to yellow. And in this case, we are using the X component of the position as its uh, uh, horizontal color. So this is why it goes from black to red. So the red component will be made of how far in the x direction it is. And the y component will be the green uh, component of the color. And so as you go up, in this, uh, up into the screen space, it gets uh, more green. Now, what we can do is we can change this to not do the transformations to center this so the whole scene is, uh, is colored in. And the reason we do this is because we want the zero point in the scene to be the very center of the screen. This will be useful for the maths we do a little bit later. The zero point is, um, or sorry, this point on the screen is negative. And this is why this bottom quadrant is black because our screen just doesn't know how to show a negative red or a green value. Now, moving on, I think the first thing we can do is start working on our, um, our distance functions. So the first distance function is distance to plane. What this does is it takes an absolute um, difference between the Y component of the vector, which means we have a plane in our scene that is uh, facing upwards. 
and this will just be the floor of our scene, so to speak. Uh, we can create another one. Uh, this one is a sphere, and what this does is it just takes the difference in length between the two positions, and it subtracts the radius. So any point within this sphere will be considered a negative value, and the ray march will just end there. The last thing I'll do is this is a torus. I didn't do the maths for this myself. This is just a common formula for working out the distance to a torus. The way that we define this torus is with two radius. Um, and one is the major radius, which is consider a donut, how big the donut is. And then the second radius will be uh, the thickness of the donut or the radius of the inner circle that uh, up, follows the donut around. Now, the next thing we need to do is combine these or compose these functions to create a distance function for our entire scene. The easiest way to do this is to take a first our distance to the plane, second our distance to the sphere and just return the smaller of the two values. And if we want to go ahead and also add the torus to the scene, all we'll have to do is one, store all of the results in array just to keep this cleaner and then just work out the minimum value um, or the minimum distance value and return that. Uh, uh, from the distance function. Secondly, to start our ray marching algorithm, we need to work out a number of iterations to the scene. Uh, we need a minimum distance and a maximum distance, and these will just be thresholds we can tweak if we want to change the accuracy of the, uh, of the visuals produced by this shader. Second of all, just a small structure that will hold the data of the ray match, the distance that it went, and how many iterations it took. Now, this, this ray match function is, uh, looks a bit big, but we'll break it down into two sections. First thing we need to do is work out the position of our current uh, or where the ray is, and we'll keep track of this for each march of the ray. And the second thing we need is the increment, uh, or, or three things. Uh, the increment is just how far into the scene we're traveling. And the last one is just an instance of the result structure that we'll just uh, change before we return that. Now, for the actual ray match itself, all we have to do is on each iteration, set the position of the ray to the origin uh, plus the distance that we've traveled in that direction. So consider a point in 3D space. We have a direction we're traveling and we just set the point to some distance along that ray. Then we will increment, uh, set the increment to the distance to our scene, which is the function we composed with the plane, the sphere and the torus. And we will increment uh, the distance structure and the iterations each time in the loop. And if we happen to be less than our minimum distance threshold or greater than our maximum distance threshold, then we'll just break there and then. And uh, last of all, we need to actually display this on the scene because currently it's just a bunch of maths and we want to actually see our, our rematched ray, world, so to speak. Now, first thing we can do is just set up some or, uh, information about a world like where the camera is, uh, where the ray will start and work out the direction. And the way we work out the direction is just by using the uh, green and red value of this color to offset the height and the trajectory of the ray that we're firing into our scene. Now, simply by taking the result of our ray march and working out how far that distance was into the scene, just a linear, a reverse linear interpolating this just to uh, prevent it from being a bit too dark, we can just set the color of each pixel to the distance in the scene. And this rematch algorithm is being run for every single pixel on the scene, which is uh, uh, why we do this on the GPU, because doing this on the CPU will just be far too inefficient. Now, I'm going to skip past quite a bit of this while I plan to do a bit more in depth. There is, um, it can get quite deep, and I think this would be a bit too much and fry your brains. Uh, I'll just show uh, the highlights using the uh, number of iterations we took we can do some cool stuff like working out some outline into the scene by adding them together we can effectively just merge the two pictures on top of each other uh, to create some like cartoony effect now i did a bunch of code here to add color to the scene just to show that it's uh, possible but you can also add color to the scene if you want to and by setting the position of the torus by time you can effectively move the torus in your scene now, this is all cool, but why, why the heck uh, would I want to know this and where is it used uh, as opposed to just traditional 3D rendering? Now, one cool technique is for fractal-based geometry. You can set the position on the distance function to be a modulo. And what this will do is effectively, every time the ray goes through the area, it will just wrap back around in the world, 
And what this does is give you infinite instances in all directions of whichever uh, model that you've created uh, with basically no uh, overhead because the algorithm is, is you're, you're adding infinite objects to the scene, but changing nothing to the expense of the function. Um, a really cool demo of someone that's made something with this that's a bit more tangible is Marble Marcher. This is a video game that uses ray marching to basically create a little game where you have to roll a marble around a fractal uh, world and get it towards the flag before the time. It's actually become a bit of a hit in the speedrunning community because it's just a, such a fun, wacky little game. And another really cool version of this is for clouds in some modern games, ray marching uh, can also be used in volumetric instances. So rather than just uh, ending the or ending the ray when it hits an object, you can let it travel through and pick up some information on how far it, or how long it was inside an object. And using that, you can work out maybe how dense some area of cloud is. And all you have to do is define your cloud as some distance function, which is exactly what the new Microsoft Flight Simulator does, which is how it creates such stunning visuals with basically little overhead. But yeah, that's uh, all from my talk. Uh, is there any questions that you folks might have? That was sick. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. I love fractals and like those kind of designs. So this was really cool. Yeah. Um, it's sorry? Go on. Oh, no, I was just going to say, yeah, it's definitely a really cool technique if you're doing fractal stuff, um, just because of the way you can mirror objects. I've seen people do um, loads. Uh, the mandel bulb is very quick to implement in uh, in, ray, or in ray matching, or as a sign distance function. Yeah, the modulo technique blows my mind because, of course, <laughs> doing, doing, I just love that. That just, yeah. So I had a question. Uh, you probably don't need to go all the way back. You can probably just answer this, but... When you were talking about the, so you've got the ray distance, so from the camera out to your world, yes. and you've got direction. Is the direction like angular, or is it in x y coordinates, or it's it's it a sing, okay. So it's just a, it's just a vector, um, free component vector, and it just specifies uh, how normally normalized, and that direction is generated generally by saying whatever the color was for mm -hmm. the triangles that we use in our scene, whether it was. If it was more red, then that means this pixel is more that way, so the ray should uh, move more in this direction. And we just multiply that vector by the distance we want to move, and it just and that makes that longer. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, is this what people in Pico 8 use when they do, like, here's a whole 3D thing in a tweet? Um, I am not familiar with Pico 8, so I'd have to have a look. But okay. Possibly. It, apparently it's a rendering engine like a really tiny pixel based rendering oh, engine oh yeah it's it's like People a baby like, engine yeah yeah it's, it's insane three possible things. it's possible um but it's very limited on what you can use with ray matching because everything has to be uh described as a distance function which very much limits the kind of geometry you can render i put a link to it in the chat and in the discord so we could check it out i can see it. um I would possibly, I would say no on this. Um, from a gut feeling, I haven't seen the implementation, but um, it's quite, uh, it'll be quite tricky to model some of that geometry with ray matching without some crazy okay. distance functions. So yeah. interesting. No, I think that was uh, everything from me. And if you folks don't have any questions, I think we're slightly early for next talk.